All right, we're going to talk about super heterodyne receivers and SDR receivers. So, get ready. Everybody hear me okay? I talk fast, I'll try not to, but if I'm going too fast, just tell me and I'll try to slow down. So, uh, here's our topics for the presentation. We're going to do a quick straw poll, and then we're going to talk about super heterodyne receivers, the advent of radio reception, calculus, algebra included. Uh, then we'll get into SDR receivers. We'll have a battle royale, which is better between a super het and an SDR. And then a little Q&A at the end if, you, if we need it. But I'm assuming there'll be no questions because this is going to be just a brilliant, brilliant PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, straw poll. Who, show of hands, has heard the word super heterodyne before? That's good. You're reading your cut sheets. Who has a, let's say, on a scale of 1 to 10, like a 3 to 4 understanding of what super heterodyne means? Who, who, who thinks they could give this presentation blind and they know everything about what super heterodyne is? Well, and that's where I was, to be honest with you. And I, I get, I, like a, a lot of people, I, I just sort of go down the rabbit hole. And I was really, it, it just one of those days that like, I don't know, probably up too late, just sitting there and it popped in my head, what does that actually mean? I mean, what the heck is it? So we're gonna go through it and we'll see if we can figure it out. So first topic, super heterodyne receivers, advent of radio reception. So what does super heterodyne mean? It's nothing to do with super califragilistic there. Basically what it means is the super refers to supersonic, which we would probably now call ultrasonic, meaning above human hearing threshold. So that, but in the, the, we're talking stuff 100 years ago and more, uh, the expression they used was supersonic. Uh, hetero is Greek for different or other, who knew it? Uh, and then dyna, or dyne, is Greek for frequency. So super heterodyne means above human hearing with different frequencies. So that gives us a little preview of what a super heterodyne receiver actually does. So this is the part that I really kind of fell into. I was, I, I, I guess the question I was trying to answer, and I didn't quite, it just, I didn't get it, was why does an AM receiver from the day that an AM receiver was invented still work today? 
why, why is it not overloaded with FM radio or cell phone signals, Wi-Fi, right? And I, I really, that was the part I was trying to understand, and I, and I was, I kind of got lost on that, and then I was trying to understand how it actually works. What are you actually doing when you tune an AM or an SSB radio? What are you actually accomplishing? So it sounds like, and what you think it's going to be, is that here's all your signals, right, coming in from your antenna, and you're sort of thinking, well, there's a big variable filter, right? A big giant something that happens, and I turn the knob, right, and the filter moves, and only the frequency I want goes through, right? That, that was sort of, you know, schoolboy understanding of what's happening. Um, the reality is that's not at all what's happening because when the process of broadcast AM reception was developed, variable filters were then and still today very complicated. A variable filter that you can turn a knob and move an electrical filter up and down in frequency is a very complicated thing to achieve. It's very expensive. And back in those days, the electronics they had to process signals really weren't even capable of working at what they considered extremely high frequencies. Remember, these are the folks that named 3.5 high frequency, right? That was HF to them. That's why we're stuck calling things like mega ultra super high frequency when we get up to 10 gig, right? These guys couldn't even imagine that. So a filter for them was just way out of reach, electrically speaking. And then when they built a filter, if they could, you were basically stuck with a trade-off. You could make a filter that was wide, but then it would be sensitive. Or you could make one that was narrow, so you'd have some selectivity, but then you'd get no sensitivity. So your choice was basically, I get only the signal I want, but not much of it. Or I get adjacent signals like we see here, but then I get enough to actually turn into an amplifier. And then the last thing is, you're still working and all your processing is still happening at the receiver frequency. So you're trying to tune in, you know, 1100 AM or 1450 AM, you still need an amplifier to turn that into a useful signal and eventually get it to your ears that's working at 1100, uh, 1100K, right? And that, again, gets back into the trouble with electronics then. So the answer was some smart guys got together and they developed the concept of a super heterodyne receiver. Before that, the receivers they used were called regenerative, which is basically a crystal radio. So, and that just wasn't the solution. So we got into super heterodyne. So here comes the math. What is basically happening in a super heterodyne receiver is that you have two, and I'm gonna use the word waves, okay? Frequencies, waves, signals, but I'm just gonna use wave for a minute. You've got two waves that are fixed in their frequency offset. So that means that they are not the same frequency, they're different, but the ratio of how different they are is fixed. So they're always staying a certain amount apart from each other, and that relationship is fixed, okay? When you do that, and you then combine those signals, you get some addition and some subtraction, right? We're looking for a difference, and we'll explain why in a second. So we're looking for a fixed mathematical difference between these two signals. I'm gonna show you some pictures of what I'm talking about here. But remember from school, uh, from school grade math here, difference is a key word that means subtraction. So we're talking about how do we subtract. So everybody has probably seen this. We talk about radio waves. It's the standard kind of pedal in a, in a pond, right? Pebble in a pond, right? So you got your wave front moving around, right? This is a single source, right? You got one wave, one frequency going out, moving out, right? The black lines are your high, the blue lines are your low. And if we put two of them together, we've all seen some kind of variation of this. This is called an interference pattern, right? Now I've got two sources of waves, or I've got a stronger signal. It adds up where they are nullifying each other. You see there's kind of an offset here, and there's less signal. So let's kind of move into more frequency, less wave. So we'll do the same thing, but now we're, we've got two adjacent signals, okay? These are, happen to be audio signals. This is a sine wave, okay? Top one is 4K, so that's 4,000 hertz. Bottom one is 4,004, okay? So they're fixed in their offset. They're offset by four hertz, all right? Sometimes they're gonna add up. So right now they're both at a peak, so they're slightly different frequency, but sometimes they add up and you get more. And then sometimes they're offset, and when you add them up, you get nothing. So you get that nullification, right? So if we put these two over each other, we get something that looks like this. And these time divisions up here show you, you're basically getting your four 
beats a second. That's that four hertz different, right? And a hertz is one cycle per second. So 4,004 minus 4,000 equals four. So we'll end up with a beat of signal four times a second, because we take the bigger one minus the smaller one. That difference is the beat of a new frequency. Now you'll notice the wave itself is still the same. We just have this new beat frequency on top of it. Some of these words should be jumping out at you, by the way. Beat frequency, sound familiar? So, what's happening with this difference is that we end up with this uh, new frequency. Now we have four hertz instead of 4,000 4, and 4,004, 4, right? And that new frequency still has the encoding of the original signal. So if it were amplitude modulation, your amplitude's changing, and that's what's actually encoding the audio signal we want to hear, it's still in this new beat frequency, okay? It's just been shifted to this new 4 hertz instead of 4,000 hertz. So the mathematical result of adding or subtracting these two signals at a new frequency creates this thing called a beat frequency. The offset we add to our original source, so we're going to create a new copy of the thing we try to get, the, the signal we want, and we're going to get into more detail so this will all be clear in a sec. That new frequency we add results in the creation of something called an intermediate frequency, or IF. Everybody heard of IF somewhere in a radio cut sheet or on a... Right? So we hear about the IF frequency. Well, what does this actually mean? Right? We've all probably seen or maybe read somewhere that most radios these days use an IF of 455 kilohertz. What that means is, if we're trying to listen to 1420, I'm using a broadcast band, trying to listen to 1420 AM, which is a local regional Mexican station I listen to sometimes, if we're going to tune the radio, we're not actually tuning anything to 1420 AM. We're tuning an oscillator, a real simple oscillator, to 1420 plus 455. So we're going to get a new signal just generated inside the radio of 1875 kilohertz. 1420 plus 455. So now I've got 1420 and 1875. Okay? Well, guess what? We already know what happens. I'm going to take 1875 minus 1420, and I'm going to get back 455. Because I added it in, you take it away, there it is. Right? Well, if you put these two signals in an AM circuit known as a mixer, which is basically just a fancy way of saying they're electrically being combined, the end result is a beat frequency. And that beat frequency, again, that new pattern that's just a result of two frequencies that are the same but shifted apart from each other, will be at 455 with the original AM material still encoded. So now we have a brand new frequency, and if you're thinking about this, no matter what frequency I'm trying to tune, I will always end up at the end of this circuit with 455 kilohertz. Make sense? So whether I tune 1100, 1200, 600, I'm going to add 455, shove them together, and then when I'm done, I'm going to get the same thing I started with at 455. Well, what does that do for us? We start over here on the left, got a pointer, got over on the left. Now we've got this kind of variable oscillator thing, right? Here's all the intended signals that are out there floating around. Here's the one we want, there's 1420. There's the new one I've created with my oscillator, 1875. I shove them in a mixer, and I end up with 455 kilohertz, all right? That is our IF frequency, our intermediate frequency. Well, now I need a filter still because I only want to get the thing I care about. All this stuff's still floating around in space, right? And we only want to amplify and deal with that one signal. Well, a fixed filter is easy. Anybody got a radio old enough to put a crystal in it? Replace your crystals for a different filter, right? So a fixed filter has always been pretty achievable. And so as a result, we can put a really super nice, precise filter at 455 kilohertz, because it's only ever got a filter at that IF frequency. It never has to deal with the broadcast band stuff. And the end result is now instead of a variable filter, we end up with a variable frequency oscillator. Anybody heard that term before? Right? When you turn the knob, you're turning a VFO, a variable frequency oscillator. 
So let's go back through our list of no-goes no with the variable filter. Variable filters are complex, expensive. Uh, they were hard to, we, there was no electronics in the early days. They couldn't do it. The accuracy was a trade-off of width versus strength. Well, with a fixed filter and just making this variable oscillator in an IF frequency, fixed filters are cheap and easy. The frequency that they have to deal with electrically back then is much lower. It's above human hearing, so we're not going to hear the artifacts, but it's much lower than the actual intended broadcast frequency. And of course, with a fixed filter, no concerns with accuracy or selectivity because we can make it as narrow as we want. So to wrap that up, again, two frequencies are mixed together. And then the result is the subtraction gives you the intermediate frequency with the original encoded material. The fixed filters reject all but the desired frequency. And then the part I really like, a happy coincidence, which is what I started with, Remember, if they had solved, if they'd worked, figured it out a way, come up with a novel approach for a variable filter, at some point they would have had to choose a bandwidth for that filter, right? So they would have said, well, we want to only get AM radio, so we're just going to keep a filter with a notch like this. But somewhere there's a left side, and somewhere there's a right side. How wide is that filter actually going to block stuff? Well, they probably start at DC, right? But then how high are they going to go? Something unimaginable like 100 megahertz? I mean, 200 megahertz, 300 megahertz, whatever unimaginable frequency they picked for the end of what they were going to filter out, would that radio work today? Not well. I mean, how many sources of interference would there be for any radio that was based on a filtering bandwidth? You'd be stuck with cell phones, VHF, UHF, Wi-Fi. I mean, everything makes RF now. And that's why an AM radio from 100 years ago works exactly precisely the same as one you can buy at Best Buy today because they ended up doing a variable frequency oscillator with an intermediate frequency. All right, maybe instead of Q&A at the end, I'll stop for a second. Any questions on sort of the concept of a super heterodyne? Is that, did that light any light bulbs for anybody or? Wanna go through it again? No questions? There's gonna be a quiz. By the way, if you guys don't volunteer to do presentations, you're gonna to listen to me every month. All right, let's move on to SDR receivers, the real hard stuff. An SDR receiver, everybody has heard of SDR receivers? Yes, show of hands. No, is it a new term? Good, everybody's heard of it. Stands for Software Defined Radio, okay? That is a radio that uses a digital signal processing path, also known as code, programming, chips, whatever, a computer, to tune signals. All of the radio is defined by the software you write into the chip. If you write an FM decoder, it decodes FM. If you write an AM decoder, it decodes AM. If you write a lower sideband with a BAFO or with a BFO, it'll give you a sideband with a, a, a beat frequency oscillator you can adjust the tune. But it's all happening in software. So the software defined means literally it starts off as nothing, a bucket full of bits, and you generate the actual radio inside. The interface between the RF world and digital is called an ADC, analog to digital converter, right? And this is really the special sweet spot of SDR radios, right? Because that's the limiting factor. ADCs are an analog device, which means we have to think about things like gain and bandwidth and saturation points and voltage and voltage drop off, right? And so the better your ADC, the more close you get to what's called an ideal receiver. This is an actual term of art for radio engineers. Whether they combine super heterodyne or regenerative or SDR, there's a term called an ideal receiver in modern engineering parlance. And what it literally means is, how close can we get to connecting an antenna directly to the ADC? Well, if the ADC's got enough gain and headroom, we're very close now. If you're only interested in a certain part of the spectrum, we can kind of do that now. Chances are you might get overloaded. That's why things like uh, Baofeng, for example, goes deaf when you're near a stronger radio or repeater because it is basically one of these, more or less connected through a very cheap uh, amplifier and into an ADC. And what happens is as soon as there's a strong signal, it overloads this and the thing can't hear anymore because it's just electrically saturated. Right? So this is basically a simple versus an ideal receiver. The only difference is any filtering in front of that ADC. If we zoom out a little and we put some stuff in front of that ADC, 
So now we got some stuff over here in yellow. Notice this jumping out at you. IF. So now, super heterodyne has become essentially a big complicated filter in front of an SDR. <coughs> so instead of being the whole receiver and handing off the signal of interest to a detector circuit or something to get your FM or your AM out, it's basically just acting as a filter so that the ADC doesn't have to work so hard. So we can get more gain on reception by having additional RF filtering. The better these devices get here, the less we need this. All right, that's it. SDR is easy. Shove all the RF into a chip, let the software sort out what's your target and what's junk. That's literally the entire concept of an SDR. And the better that ADC in that chip gets, the closer we get to a two device circuit diagram. As the performance gain, bandwidth, and bit resolution of the ADC get better, we need less RF filtering until eventually we reach that ideal receiver. That's it, SDR is easy. So let's get into the Battle Royale. I'm gonna pick which one is better. Ready, I'm gonna tell you which one's a better receiver. No way, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna get into a fight, and this is gonna go on YouTube, and then I'm gonna get comments, and it ain't gonna happen. Here's what it boils down to. Super heterodyne receivers tend to have, I'm gonna use a, a term here, character. Uh, I have character, and pretty much nobody likes me, so it, having character isn't necessarily a good thing, but it is something that you can come to think of as predictable based on your experiences. This particular eagle receiver is expe ex uh, exceptionally sensitive or has a very narrow filtering capability for CW or has some kind of desirable characteristic, right? Generally speaking, super heterodyne receivers are quieter because you've got a lot of RF filtering. So you're doing a lot of work before you ever hear anything with your ears to get rid of the stuff that isn't target. Of course, maybe it is target, you just don't know that that guy, that rare DX is just a few kilohertz to the left of where you're tuned, right? But it, because you've got a quiet receiver, you're not getting that. So quiet isn't good, it's just different. It's the way it is. It is, however, more pleasing. You're not gonna get to fatigue listening to a super head receiver usually. Super heterodyne receivers have knobs and buttons, and if I'm honest, that's probably why most of us work in ham radio, or play in ham radio anyway, because we like bob buttons and knobs, right? Like, I mean, that's really what it boils down to. And uh, these are electrical devices, and so they have electrical interfaces. SDR receivers have tons of features. This is your waterfalls, and menus, and software control, and putting stuff on the internet, and VPNs, and all that junk. Uh, but that also means more menus and firmware and updates and uh, sending it back when you accidentally load your Word document into the firmware file, right? <laughs> Again, features equals complexity. Complexity isn't necessarily bad, but it could be. Uh, generally speaking, SDR receivers are thought of as noisier, but if you think about it, the reason why they're noisier is because they're getting everything. It's up to you when you operate and the quality of the software that defines that radio to give you a tool set to selectively find the signal you want and tune it. So they give you tons of filtering and tons of bandwidth flexibility and tons of the ability to adjust your reception. And frankly, one of the biggest things when it comes to SDR, turn down the gain. If you have an SDR receiver and you, you have a hard time or it's always noisy or the, you listen to somebody else's receiver and the noise floor is high and you listen to an older receiver and you go, that just sounds better because there's no noise floor. Why, why is it so quiet? Well, on a super heterodyne receiver, what do you turn your, what do you run your gain at? Your receipt, your RX gain, your R, uh, Tom? And what do you run your RF gain at? Half? Ooh. Yeah, about halfway, right? Everybody, 12 o'clock makes sense, right? What do you suppose you should start with on an SDR receiver on your receive gain, your RF gain? Any guesses? 5% is a good starting place. <laughs> Basically just above zero, right? And you use AF and filtering to pull those signals out. Very rarely does an SDR need to be much higher than maybe 20%. Very rarely, right? So if you have one of those ICOM 7300s or something like that, turn the gain down. You'll see a huge difference. Start turning the gain down, turn your AF up. So as far as which is better, I don't know. I, I, have, I, I like old radios. I think they sound great. They're fun to play with. Tubes glow. It's all pretty, right? It's all good stuff. But the industry is absolutely trending towards SDR. They're cheaper to produce, cheaper to stock. 
they can sit on a shelf for 20 years and work the same as the first day they were there. Um, SDR receivers are very common. ICOM, the 7300, a very popular SDR receiver, flex radios. There's others, I mean, but that's an idea. Hybrid radios are pretty much, if you're buying a modern radio that was released in, say, the last five to seven years and it has things like a waterfall on it, you're probably using a hybrid receiver. Pretty much everybody makes one of those. Elcraft, Delinco, Kenwood, the, uh, the, the, even that new uh, Yesu FT, FTX10, FTDX10X. Yes. What? Yes. Yeah, that's a hybrid SDR receiver. So you're doing RF stuff with the old techniques, and then when you're done, you've got things cleaned up and calmed down, then it goes into an SDR. But it's still an SDR. That's how you get that fancy waterfall. Some radios are pure SDR. There's very little RF stuff in front of that ADC. Flex, ICOM, uh, Shigu is a popular low-cost one. Those are all pretty much very, very close to an ideal receiver in terms of their circuiting. If you looked at a, a schematic form, be precious little between the antenna port and the ADC. And of course, you can still buy from all the main manufacturers super heterodyne receivers that don't have a DSP within them. No waterfalls, though. So uh, that is actually the end. Uh, do you have any questions about any of the Superhead SDR comparisons? Anything I can try to answer? Yeah, jump in. Um, back probably last year when I was playing around with uh, RTL SDR, I noticed that a lot of the software made reference to uh, I and Q frequencies. Are those the frequencies that make up the intermediate? Uh, so say you're just at, I, I missed the say the end part again. So the, the what makes reference to what? Um, is it is, is the the frequencies that it references the I and the Q? Are those the components? No, no. So up? I and Q are, um, and I, I'm going to run out of talent skill real fast here. Okay. Uh, when you digitize an RF signal, when you digitize any analog signal, you end up with a quadratic equation. Everybody remember a quadratic equation? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You end up with that, and you get basically information at right angles. And IQ has something to do with that. There's a first sample and a second sample. There's actually not an IF in the RTL SDR, which is why it will instantly overload because there's it's that is that is basically an ideal receiver. It doesn't necessarily work as an ideal receiver because it'll overload. And it'll go stone deaf on you if you connect it to a long dipole or something. It won't hear anything. Yeah, I had to put an attenuator on mine. But yeah, if you do that, if you put a pad on it or if you put a crappy antenna on it, you'll pick up all kinds of wonderful stuff. And an RTL SDR is a, a lot of people's first introduction to it because it's 25 bucks and easy to play with. Yep. It was actually a cable, it was actually a European cable TV or uh, over the air TV tuner chip that somebody figured out they could rejigger. It's a good question. Uh, there is a video, I put it on my website, uh, w4bpp.com. Uh, I just put a link to the YouTube there. Uh, there's a guy, it's called Technology Connections. He's kind of a nerd that like does videos about uh, washers and dryers and dishwashers and blenders and toasters and stuff at Disney. And he just kind of, anything technical, Sony TVs, you ever want to know what Trinitron is? He has a whole video explaining that. He has an, a surprisingly good video on super heterodyne receivers, and he actually does this. Uh, I stole the screenshots from his video. He actually does that 4,000 hertz versus 4,004 hertz demo as an audio demo, and you can actually hear the beat frequency. And he's got some other demos that are kind of hard to pull off in PowerPoint, but it, it's worth clicking on. It's a, it's a kind of a cute, interesting video, and the guy's talented and worth watching. So I posted it on my website, w4bpp.com. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Remember, get your presentations in, you gotta listen to me every month. <laughs>